In this lecture, we're going to discover what the study of economics is all about. And it really boils down to a couple very simple concepts. Scarcity versus non-satiation. Let's talk about what those words mean. Scarcity simply means that resources are limited. So to be considered scarce, a resource must be limited and desirable. So, for example, we wouldn't say that the polio virus is scarce because although it may be limited, it may not, it's not desirable. You know, you don't want to get polio. Um, but some examples of, of resources that could be considered scarce would be time. Um, we can use money as an example. Although money isn't technically one of the factors of production, we use it to purchase the resources that we need to manufacture products. Um, space is considered scarce. That's what these buildings are representing here, is space on planet Earth. Um, we have limited entrepreneurial ideas and entrepreneurial abilities, so entrepreneurs are considered scarce. Um, but our resources available to us are scarce. They will eventually run out, even though you know you may think that there are endless amounts of sand on the beach. It's actually finite because eventually, if we used all the sand, we would eventually run out. So we would even say that sand is considered scarce. Non-satiation means that our wants are unlimited. And as humans, this is just human nature. We always want more than we have. Um, whenever we get what we want, we want something else. So even, you know, we could say if you're thirsty and you quench your thirst, well, you know, give yourself a couple hours and you're going to be thirsty again. You're going to want to purchase another drink or another, you know, something to eat or whatever. Um, let's say there's something that you wanted for your birthday and you finally got that toy or that gadget or that new cell phone. You know, give it a month or give it a year and you're going to want something different. There's going to be a newer and better model of the cell phone that came out and you're going to want that one instead or you're going to be done playing with that toy so you're going to want a different toy. Um, no matter what we have, we want more. Our wants are truly unlimited. And this leads us to what we call the pig principle. The pig principle says, generally speaking, people prefer n plus one units to n units of the same good. And what does this mean? Well, this really means that people always want more than they have. I was eating at the Mandarin Buffet um, a couple of years ago, and this was my fortune cookie inscription, and I thought it was appropriate to share here. Our necessities are few, but our wants are endless. So really, this is just explaining what economics is all about. We always want more. Here's a cartoon that I ran across that also applies. Um, for those of you who celebrate Christmas, here's Santa Claus with the little girl on his lap. And you can see that her wish list is very long, and Santa says, it would help narrow it down if you just told me what you don't want. You know, because this girl wants a million things. All right, well, none of that would be a problem. Wanting, wanting things would not be a problem if we were able to fulfill all our wants. But we know that that's not possible because of scarcity. Hence the problem. Hence the study of economics. Um, economics is known as the dismal science because um, it's, it's a problem that can never be solved. We're always going to have unlimited wants and we're always going to have limited resources. So it's kind of a sad picture. But let's uh, look at this, you know, from, from a snapshot. Let's look at what economics is all about in terms of some of the lingo that we're going to be using. Um, so we have scarcity of productive resources. Uh, the different types of productive resources that we will deal with in this class are land, labor, and capital. Okay, so all goods and services in a society are produced from these categories of productive resources. Land would include all the natural resources in a product the things from the earth that are used to manufacture something. Um, labor is the human input, you know, all the jobs that people have to do to make a good or service possible. And capital, um, we have two types of capital, both, both physical and human capital. Um, these are the machinery, equipment, and tools that are used to manufacture goods and services, um, you know, manufacture goods or provide services. So physical capital would be things like a hammer or a company car or, you know, a saw or a computer, if your computer is used at your job to make your, your service possible. And human capital is like the machinery, equipment, and tools of the human mind. So, um, for example, going to college would help increase your human capital because that makes you a better worker. Or getting an internship at a company would increase your human capital. 
So it kind of increases your worth because it increases your productivity. Um, the entrepreneur is the person who combines the land, labor, and capital to make the good or service um, a reality. So for example, for example, let's say we're going to have a class car wash to raise money for a pizza party, okay? The natural resources, the land that we would need would be things like water. We would need an actual spot, a plot of land on planet Earth to have our car wash, maybe a parking lot of a gas station or something like that. Um, I would say we need sunshine because no one's going to come get their car washed on a day when it's downpouring. Uh, the natural, um, or I'm sorry, the, the labor, the human input that we would need, we would need people to do different jobs such as go and hold out a sign on the road. We would need people to, you know, use the hose. We would need people to collect money. We would need people to scrub the car. We'd need people to dry off the car, etc. cetera. Um, the capital that we would need, the physical capital that we would need would include um, things like a hose, a money collection box, um, you know, let's see, rags and um, towels and sponges and, and things of that nature, vacuum cleaners if we're going to clean the inside of the car. Um, and the entrepreneur would be whoever's in charge of this whole endeavor. So if it was our class, it'd probably be me as the teacher making sure that all this stuff comes together to produce this car wash, to produce this service of, of car wash for people who are going to come pay money for it so we can raise money for our pizza party. Okay, that's just an example, but every good or service is made from these, these categories of the factors of production. Because these resources are scarce, we can't use them to make everything that everyone wants because people's wants are unlimited. So when we're deciding what we're going to make, we have to make choices. Okay, every society has to choose how to use their productive resources and what goods and services they're going to produce. And in doing that, there are three questions that have to be answered by each society. And the way these questions are answered helps determine the type of economic system um, that's in place in that society. So here are the three questions. These are known as the three key questions of economics for each society. All right, the first is called the allocation question because we're deciding how we're going to allocate our scarce productive resources. So how much of each good should we produce? How are we going to use our resources? Um, how much of each thing are we going to make? You know, how are we going to use our resources? How much of our resources are we going to use to make good A versus good B, et cetera? So every society has to decide what they're going to make. The second question is the production question, and this has to do with how the production actually occurs. So how should the goods actually be produced? Are we going to have assembly lines? Are we going to have specialization or are we going to have individuals produce goods and services from start to finish by themselves? Um, or are we going to have robots do everything? Um, are people going to get to pick their job or is the government going to assign you a job? Or does your, um, does your tribe of people work communally to produce goods and services? So every society will answer that production question differently. And then the distribution question is who should get the goods that are produced? Now that we've made these goods and services out of our scarce productive resources, um, how are we going to decide who gets what and how much of each thing? And every society answers that differently as well. So for example, here in um, the United States, you get things that you're willing and able to pay for. So if you have money, you get the goods and services. And that's how we, dis we answered the distribution question. But you know, other societies do it differently. Now that these choices have been made about how we're going to use our scarce productive resources, um, we have to think about the costs incurred in those choices because every choice has a cost. What are the trade-offs? What is the opportunity cost for those choices? And we can best minimize those costs by using marginal analysis. So let's talk quickly about those terms. A trade-off is any situation in which one thing must be decreased for another to be increased. For example, I faced a trade-off between eating and buying my medicine. Someone on a fixed income might, might feel that way. Um, every time you do more of one thing, you have to do less of something else because we have limited time. Um, or if you're talking about, you know, a batch of cookie dough that you whipped up, the more cookie dough you eat, the less fresh baked cookies you're going to have coming out of the oven, you know. So more of one thing by default means less of another because resources are limited. And there's a specific term for the highest valued alternative you give up when you make a choice, and that's called opportunity cost. So opportunity cost is what you lose when you choose. It's also known as the real cost, um, not necessarily a monetary cost, but a cost of resources or other opportunities. Okay, for example, during the time you're watching this lecture, you could be doing something else that you'd probably actually rather be doing with your time. So whatever you would be doing if you weren't watching this lecture, 
is your opportunity cost for watching the lecture because it's the opportunity that you're losing, the, the thing that you're giving up in order to do this. So if you would rather be watching TV, if you'd be watching TV if you weren't watching this lecture, then the opportunity cost for you of watching this lecture is watching TV. For other people it might be shopping or reading a book or hanging out with your friends or doing homework for another class. Um, it just depends on what your highest valued alternative is. That is your opportunity cost. All right, there's also a difference between explicit and implicit costs of, um, of every choice that's made. So explicit costs are actual money payments where you actually hand cash to someone or write them a check or pay with a credit card, but there's actually money changing hands. Um, implicit costs are the loss of resources or other opportunities. So implicit costs would be those trade-offs and the opportunity cost, um, whereas explicit cost is the actual actual cash cost, okay? And we'll talk more about that um, in class. Marginal analysis, then, um, is how we minimize all these different types of costs. And we want to do that because our resources are limited. We want to use them as efficiently and as wisely as possible to satisfy the wants and needs of the people in our society. So we're going to make sure that we exercise marginal analysis or make our decisions on the margin. Um, and that means that we're making decisions based on the change one more unit would bring about. For example, when a person doesn't make an all or nothing decision to eat a bag of potato chips, but decides instead, chip by chip or on the margin, whether to eat another one. Okay, just because you open a big old bag of Doritos doesn't mean you have to eat the whole bag. Okay, you're going to eat a chip at a time until you're satisfied and until the costs of eating another chip outweigh the benefits and you're going to stop and you're going to put the clothespin on the bag and put it back in the cupboard and, and have more another day when you're hungry. Um, so we use a lot of marginal analysis in economics. Decisions don't have to be all or nothing, but the best decisions are often um, a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Okay, And when we decide if the marginal or additional costs are greater than or less than the additional benefits of doing one more unit of something, producing one more unit of a good, or hiring one more unit of labor, etc. And that's how we're going to make our decisions in economics. So, in conclusion, economics focuses on choices, and it's the study of how people choose to use scarce resources to satisfy their wants. And every society does this differently, um, but this is really what economics all boils down to. Scarcity of resources versus non-satiation.